Okay, it's nine o'clock and we have to get started on time because for anyone who's looked at the program, it is a very, very full program and I can't start late. So I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them and their elders past, present and future. Welcome to Biofuturing Australia. It's been almost three years since we've held a national conference. So it's so excited to have everyone here. And over the three days of events, we have over 300 people registered. So it's, uh, it's definitely a sign that A, everyone's coming back together post COVID, but also I think it's a real sign in relation to the energy that's around you know, Australia's bio future and, and what we really see into the future. So we have some great, um, we have some great presentations taking place today and really looking forward to seeing them all. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors of this event. So we have the Queensland Government, who we love working with and they're such an incredible team. And I would encourage anyone who's looking at developing a bioenergy project to be talking to the team that's here today, uh, led by Michael Burke, who I'm sure everybody in the room knows. Uh, we have EDL, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, Manildra, LMS, and AMPC. So we're delighted to have them all on board as sponsors. Now, we do today have uh, Lisa Blair, who is a world record holder, and she's gonna inspire us all with her story and also her use of biofuels, which I'm really excited about. So today we actually have a copy of Lisa's book which is going to every one of our speakers and sponsors. So that's our speaker gift today. And if anyone's interested in getting a copy of Lisa's book um, outside of this, I'm sure you can get them at bookstores or just go and hassle Lisa during a break and she'll be able to tell you where you can get them. Toilets, for anyone that doesn't know, straight across on the other side there. Obviously, you can all tell this is an indoor-outdoor venue. Uh, we wanted natural ventilation, but also it's my favourite venue in Australia. So. Um, there will be noise, the coffee machine will be going while people are in here. Don't feel anxious about going and getting a coffee. We aren't allowed to have food or drinks in here other than water, um, but please feel free to be relaxed and comfortable and enjoy the time. Um, and then finally, I would really just like to, to make a really big thank you to the Bioenergy Australia staff. We are a tiny team um, of three paid staff and we try to do a lot more than, um, than what we probably should, to be honest. Uh, so I'd yeah, like to say a really big thank you to, to Lauren and Julia and, and Hallie, our intern, who's out the front today as well. And I'd also like to thank our Bioenergy Australia board members who, um, over this really challenging time, have been incredibly supportive and encouraging and, um, yeah, and, and wonderful. So to kick off today, I would like to introduce one of our sponsors, so Jason Dickfoss, who is the head of growth for EDL, and I can't see him. He is, so here he is, here he comes. So he is going to introduce this session, and thank you. Looking forward to meeting anyone that I haven't already met, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, Shahana, and good morning, everyone. It's amazing to see so many people here. Uh, welcome to this scene setting session. This is where we lift our gaze and look at the significant contribution that bioenergy can make to Queensland and Australian economies and efforts to decarbonise and the reasons why it's important for all of us. My name is Jason, Jason Dickfoss, and I lead business development for EDL. We're a leading global producer of sustainable distributed energy, proudly headquartered here in Brisbane. EDL has been part of the circular economy for more than 30 years, striving to create more value from waste. We own and operate nearly 100 low carbon power stations across Australia, North America and Europe, including a portfolio of landfill gas field power plants. We also own and operate three landfill to biomethane plants in the, in the United States and are cons currently constructing two more. By this time next year, we'll be injecting around seven PJs of green gas into the North American network. And are keen to bring that, very keen to bring that expertise back home here to Australia. EDL is proud to be a leading sponsor of today's conference. And I'd like to thank Shahana for the opportunity to introduce our three session speakers here this morning. 
Here in this room, we know how valuable a role bioenergy can play. Biomethane can help decarbonise industrial heat and electricity and is a reliable baseload source of power. It can be used to produce both low carbon transport biofuels and green hydrogen. Its production also generates digestate used to improve agricultural soils as well as commercial grade carbon dioxide, which can help decarbonise the concrete industry. Last year, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency's Bioenergy Roadmap concluded that Australia can produce over 100 PJs of pipeline quality green gas every year. And that investing in bioenergy could reduce the nation's greenhouse gas emissions by 9%, reduce organic waste going to landfill by 6%, power up to 20% of the nation's renewable electricity supply, and increase GDP by $10 billion by 2050. A strong bioenergy industry would support regional communities, including by providing tens of thousands of new jobs. It seems like a no-brainer, but I am a bit biased. To start our discussion, let me know, let, let me now welcome our new federal minister, who I believe virtually we're welcoming, for climate change and energy. A man who has had to hit the ground running, it's fair to say. Thank you, it's all right. Chris was first elected to federal parliament, parliament in 2004 and was ably represented the people of the seat of McMahon in Western Sydney ever since. He's held key responsibilities in the Rudd and Gillard governments, including serving as treasurer and as minister for variously competition and consumers affairs, financial services, human services, immigration and citizenship, tertiary education, skills science and small business. Chris led the Labor Party in opposition and has been Shadow Treasurer and Shadow Minister for Small Business and Financial Services, Health and Climate Change and Energy. Most importantly for today, Chris is in charge of steering Australia into our low carbon future while ensuring we have the reliable and affordable energy we need to power our homes and businesses. Frankly, that's a hell of a challenge and we've seen what's been happening with our gas and electricity markets over the last few weeks. If there's a man who understands those dynamics and solutions, including the role a strong Australian bioenergy bio industry can play, it's Chris Bowen, and we're very glad to have him speaking here with us today virtually. My pleasure to be joining you at this conference, and I apologise for not being there in person, as I very much would have liked to have been. I want to begin by celebrating the fact that I join you from the lands of the Gadigal people, the Eora Nation, pay my respects to their elders. Not long after becoming Labor's Shadow Minister for Climate and Energy early last year, I paid a visit to LMS Energy Landfill Biogas Site in Northern Adelaide. I was incredibly impressed by the work of John and Matt Falzon and their team, providing power to local homes through their combined biogas and solar operation. It gave me a first look at some of the great opportunities for bioenergy as Australia transforms to a renewable economy. Of course, I've since learned that they are just one of many great bioenergy providers in this country. So it's fitting that this is one of my first speeches as Climate Change and Energy Minister, talking to you at the Biofuture Bio Futuring Australia conference today. I want to thank Bioenergy Australia for their invitation and their strong engagement with me and my office, both in opposition and since the swearing in. We've got a lot of work to do together. Australia needs a range of solutions to achieve decarbonisation and to make net zero a reality, and bioenergy will be a big part of that. In opposition, I welcomed the previous government's bioenergy roadmap, which showed bioenergy had potential sustainable energy potential. The potential to supply a portion of our domestic gas, aviation fuel, and 33% of industrial heat while adding $10 billion to GDP each year and 26,000 jobs by 2030. What I lamented was that they chose to stop there. The roadmap acknowledged potential, but the government chose not to use any levers at their disposal to help drive demand and invest in the sector and develop the necessary technology to reach that potential. Australia now has a clear opportunity to do just that under the Albanese government's Powering Australia policy. This policy will support the development of new clean energy sectors, such as bioenergy, to help decarbonise industries, including aviation fuel, which I know is a key focus for you. Australia needs emissions reduction solutions, such as 
sustainable aviation fuel that can support immediate decarbonisation of energy intensive industries like aviation. Qantas has announced earlier this year that they have set a target of 10% sustainable fuels by 2030 and 60% by 2050 is a positive step forward. But it's important that Qantas can source its SAF from Australia, ensuring that jobs and economic benefits that come with SAF stay in this country. Power, under the Powering Australia policy of the Albanese government, we are going to support the bioenergy industry in three key ways. First, there's an additional investment, powering Australia's $3 billion for a national reconstruction fund to support innovation in new industries, revitalise manufacturing and secure Australia's energy future. This funding will pursue commercial opportunities in a range of sectors, including bioenergy and biomass, that will be based on the success of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation model. Additionally, Powering the Regions Fund will open up uncommitted funding from the ERF to CSF to support the industry's decarbonisation priorities beyond just the purchase of ACUs, including things like fuel switching, bioenergy and hydrogen. Secondly, we will put an end to the uncertainty surrounding the investment mandates of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the Australian Renewable Energy Agency arena. In my view, these were used as political footballs by the previous minister and Barnaby Joyce and others for the better part of a parliamentary term. This has got to end. They aren't slush funds for ministerial pet projects. They're incredible institutions Australia can be proud of and a proud legacy of the previous Labor government. We will grow that legacy through ensuring their mandates for clean technology, including bioenergy, are protected. Thirdly, the Albanese government's improvements to the safeguard mechanism will help drive industrial demand for bioenergy and other low emissions technologies. The safeguard mechanism will reduce emissions baselines predictably and gradually over time to 2050, reaching net zero. These new baseline settings will be the subject of detailed consultation with the industry and community to ensure they are fair, efficient and effective. And the aforementioned National Reconstruction and Powering the Regions funds will help support industry to develop and adopt the necessary technology for these revised baselines. So these are three immediate reform directions related to bioenergy, but the broader message is to say that in relation to climate action, Australia is under new management. And that presents great opportunities for your sector. Just four months ago, in mid-February, I lamented Australia's lack of climate ambition at the Bioenergy 2030 conference. I proceeded to pledge that an Albanese Labor government would lift Australia's nationally determined contribution by 43% by 2030 to bring Australia into step with leading equivalent economies. I'm proud to be the minister that will oversee the updating of our nationally determined contribution. The 43% 2030 target puts Australia on a credible track to meet our commitment to net zero by 2050, a commitment that we will seek to enshrine in legislation. This government has the vision and plans to ensure we seize this moment and to set the nation on a pathway of job creation, investment opportunity, and I'm truly excited for the opportunities for Australia's regions for bioenergy. It's still early days and you'll hear plenty more from me in the weeks and months ahead. But it's clear that Australia now has a great opportunity to reset its climate agenda and make the most of the opportunities that renewable energy has to offer our economy. And you are a vital part of this reset. Enjoy your conference. We've got lots of work to do together. Thank you, Minister. And I don't think the standout message there, I think, for all of us is the bioenergy sector is now starting to get a lot of attention and, and the diverse opportunities and the many different ways that bioenergy can contribute um, provides amazing opportunities for all of us. I'm now pleased to introduce Michelle Bauer, the Deputy Director General for State Development. Michelle is here representing Dr. Stephen Miles, the Deputy Premier and Minister for State Development, Local Government and Planning. Michelle has a long experience in economic development with a focus on industry development, investment attraction and regional infrastructure. She has a background in the Office of the Coordinator General, leading complex environmental impact assessments, land acquisitions and negotiating agreements with major infrastructure providers and private sector investors. Her career has included whole of government infrastructure planning for mineral processing and industrial development in Northwest and North Queensland. 
As part of those roles, she has led international trade and investment activities for state and commonwealth initiatives. There are two great things about having Michelle here today. First, she's the perfect person to speak about addressing many of the key challenges involved in developing a robust bioenergy industry. We know how to produce green gas. That's relatively easy. The hard parts are how to secure sufficient feedstocks, how to enable the delivery pipeline, and how to ensure that customers can have recognised the value that bioenergy end users bring. It's a complex set of issues to address. Doing so will involve our industry working closely with a range of stakeholders, including the federal, state and local governments and across multiple portfolios. The second thing is that we're not starting from a blank piece of paper. The Queensland Government already has a strong track record in this space, being the first state to implement a biofutures 10-year roadmap and action plan. The goal is to grow the state's bioproducts and biotechnology sector into a $1 billion industry by 2026. To talk about how we deliver that goal together, can I introduce Michelle? Good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, I remember three years ago being in this venue and so much has changed and I think we've got a great opportunity ahead of us. So thank you, Bioenergy Australia. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we gather today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I thank the Honourable Chris Bowen, Minister for Climate Change and Energy for his message to all of us today. He certainly picked up on that theme of collaboration. I would also like to extend apologies on behalf of the Honourable Stephen Miles, Deputy Premier, Minister for State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning, and Minister assisting the Premier on Olympics infrastructure, who is unable to attend today. While he is currently overseas, the Deputy Premier is very much aware of what the biofutures sector is bringing to Queensland in terms of investment, jobs and innovation. What an exciting time to be involved in biofutures. Now more than ever, customers, governments, shareholders, corporations and their supply chains are looking for solutions to reduce carbon footprints and ensure that they can participate in a decarbonised market. I'm sure as you look around the room today, you can see how the industry is booming and I can say the conversations that I had with people last night at a coffee this morning were really encouraging. As global demand for cleaner fuels grows, Queensland is seizing the opportunity to grow the industry and secure more jobs. The Queensland Government launched the state's first Biofutures Roadmap and Action Plan in 2016 to help establish Queensland as a world-leading and sustainable region for the biofutures industry. Since its release, the government has undertaken significant work to grow the biofutures industry and to elevate the state's profile as a leading biofutures investment destination. In addition to the significant project facilitation role undertaken by our Biofutures Queensland team, led by Michael Burke, we have provided $31 million to the biofutures sector and supported 42 projects through four significant infrastructure biofutures, sorry, biofutures funding programs. And these collaborative efforts are bringing results. We have participated in a number of Australian first trials and participated with industry to position Queensland as a leader in biofutures. The Queensland Government has partnered with Brisbane Airport, Virgin Australia, GIVO, DB Schreckner and Caltex on the first Australian trial of sustainable aviation fuels. During the trial, over 1 million kil kilometres were flown by more than 700 domestic and international flights using a SAF blend. Our work in SAF is continuing, recently attracting Oceana Biofuels to Queensland to establish Australia's first commercial sustainable aviation fuel biorefinery in Gladstone. The $500 million facility is a significant step in growing the emerging biofutures industry. This partnership strengthens our work towards creating a sustainable biomanufacturing and bioenergy sector for Queensland 
fueling our economic future and contributing to our decarbonisation targets. Another Australian first was the trial of 100% renewable diesel to fuel high-end Scania V8 test engine, fuelled by Southern Oil's plant that the government attracted to the state in 2017. Southern Oil's advanced biofuels pilot plant at Yarwin near Gladstone has pioneered the refining of renewable diesel fuel made from waste plastic, old vehicle tyres, agriculture and forestry waste and biosolids. We are working with partners in the air, on the ground and as earlier this year in the sea. In April, we partnered with shipping company ANL on the first biofuel trial on a containerised shipping vessel within Oceana. The 42-day journey commenced in Brisbane and travelled via Southeast Asia and key Australian ports. Since 2016, we've also seen two biorefinery pilot plants established in Mackay and Gladstone. Internationally, fuel security is a major issue. Biorefineries like these will help improve Australia's sovereign capability to produce and distribute fuels. Thanks to the work that we have done over the past seven years and with you as our partners, Queensland is now in a position to deliver on opportunities in bioenergy, biochemicals, plastics and in future foods. That's why we have refreshed our 10-year roadmap and action plan as part of the $3.34 billion Queensland Jobs Fund. Our refreshed action plan demonstrates the Queensland Government's continued commitment to growing the biofuels industry, biofuturess industry. It recognises changing global influences and industry advances have created new challenges while opening up new opportunities for market diversification. Like being able to address vulnerabilities in Australia's supply chain, food and fuel security that were highlighted by the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic through bioproducts and bioenergy solutions. A key part of the refreshed action plan is to continue to partner with sectors like aviation, maritime and heavy vehicles to help them decarbonise and transition to more sustainable fuel sources. Queensland is already leading a leading destination for clean investment. We are working to promote our state's economic future by creating a globally focused, diverse economy that delivers high value, high knowledge based jobs. Queensland is renewable re already, right now, and the biofuturess industry will continue to play a major role in reaching our net zero emissions goal by 2050. Our state has considerable advantages in biofuturess, an, ide an ideal climate, a mature and modern agriculture industry, well-established supply chains, a skilled workforce, and innovative research institutions. Biofuturess Queensland and State Development are looking forward to our next chapter of working with you, our stakeholders and partners. I really hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Finally, I'd like to introduce Lisa Blair. Lisa is the ice maiden the first woman to sail solo around Antarctica in 2017 in her boat named Climate Action Now. That journey took 183 days and every last ounce of Lisa's spirit to complete. You can read all about her remarkable voyage in her book called Facing Fear. Unsurprisingly, Lisa is also a member of Climate Action Now, the Queensland Conservation Council's voice on climate change. The Council is the peak body of Queensland's environmental movement and, like Lisa, is passionate in its advocacy for strong government action to bring about zero carbon future. To hear about the courage and commitment it will take to do so, I'll invite Lisa to speak. Hi everyone. Um, well, welcome to the conference. I'm looking forward to sharing my voyage with you all today. Um, just to get us started and kind of set the scene of what it's like sailing solo around Antarctica, I'm just going to kick us off with a very short video. Everything was like mounting up. And after 
five days of just extreme sleep deprivation, I just felt like I couldn't keep going. I felt like the world was telling me not to go and I started listening to those doubters and I started listening to the, to the naysayers that were saying, don't go, you can't do it. I'm so close to home. <sighs> Cabin's been demolished because I've just been ripping stuff apart. I just can't go through it again. Looks fun, right? Who wants to come sailing? <laughs> So way back in 2014, I made the commitment to go out and set the world record as the fastest person to sail solo, non-stop and unassisted around Antarctica. Unfortunately, in the record attempt in 2017, I suffered a catastrophic dismasting in the Southern Ocean and I ended up having to make a landfall in Cape Town, which caused me to no longer be eligible for the overall speed record. So being as stubborn as I am, I decided I would go again. So after surviving for 183 days in the Southern Ocean, five years later, I went out and I set off to do the record a second time with the intention of breaking that overall speed record. So on February 21st, 2022, just a couple of months ago, I set off into the Southern Ocean where I sailed directly south to 45 degrees south before turning left and heading out across the South Pacific Ocean. I passed below Tasmania, below New Zealand, and off we went. 30 days into my voyage, I sailed into what is known as the most remote location in the ocean. It is the furthest point from land that you can get anywhere in the world. And at any one point in time, I was over 1,500 nautical miles from the nearest landmass, and I was closer to the astronauts in space than I was to any person on any piece of land anywhere in the world. So I sailed through Point Nemo, also known as the Pole of Inaccessibility, and then I started to close in on Cape Horn. Now, Cape Horn is the most southern tip of the South American coastline, and is considered the Mount Everest of sailing. It is the most dangerous location in the world that a sailor can sail around. So to do it solo is this incredible challenge, and for me, was considered one of the highest risk sections of the whole voyage. Take a look. Hi everybody, so it's day 45 at sea, and guess what? There's Cape Horn! It's so exciting! <laughs> so I saw land for the first time in 45 days. I also saw my first ship in 45 days and rounded Cape Horn in 45 days. So it's been a huge day of milestones. Still really iffy weather, there's wind up and down and all over the shop, but we've made it. We've safely passed Cape Horn and I just, I couldn't be more proud. So I just summited Everest twice for the second time in my life. So, you know, that enthusiasm was just, it was unreal experience. Following on from Cape Horn, I started entering into the South Atlantic Ocean and then sailed across the South Indian Ocean. Now, those two oceans, funnily enough, were basically one big storm. And I would end up in these storm conditions that were so extreme that my boat that weighs 10 tonnes would literally get picked up by these waves the size of a five-storey building and thrown. Like, we're getting airborne in a 10-tonne boat in these conditions. And for me, being a solo sailor, I have to make sure that I'm not getting injured. I'm not putting myself at risk. So I would lash myself down in my bunk inside the boat and basically just hold on for the ride. Because by that point, there's not a lot of things that you can do to keep the boat even safer. So I would go through these incredible storms, winds the size of cyclones and 100 kilometer hour winds. And on top of that, you've got snowstorms and blizzards. So to say that it was a brutal adventure is a little bit of an understatement. And one of the biggest aspects of this trip is actually the sleep deprivation. So when I'm close to land or near known hazards, I would only sleep for 20 minutes at a time. Every 20 minutes, I would have to get up, scan the horizon, and then I'd try and get another 20 minutes sleep. When I'd get further afield, especially down around Antarctica, being so remote an area, I was able to increase my sleeps up to sort of 40 minutes, sometimes an hour, if I was actually lucky. And so that sleep deprivation added up to chronic fatigue while I was at sea. And as you can see, I hit breaking point multiple times in this journey. But I was doing it. I was sailing solo around Antarctica. I sailed past my position of dismasting, where everything went horribly wrong last time, which was turned into the book that, you'll be, that the speakers will be receiving at this event. 
and I was able to start closing in onto the Australian coastline. And finally, after being at sea for 92 days, this happened. An emotional reunion with family after three months at sea. Hi. Now that's a bear hug. <laughs> Today, sailor Lisa Blair was greeted by the Albany community as she made her way across the finish line, setting a new record for the fastest non-stop unassisted solo voyage around Antarctica, coming in at 92 days, 18 hours and 14 minutes, 10 days faster than the previous record set by Russian Fedor Konyakov. We're going to hit dry land for the first time in 92 well days. Yeah. <laughs> So that was Wednesday, three weeks ago. Um, so I've only been on dry land for three whole weeks in all of this time. Um, it was this incredible moment in my journey, but this whole record wasn't just about a girl on a boat sailing solo around Antarctica. And my boat was actually called Climate Action Now. And so through all of my sailing, I've been running this awareness campaign for our communities. And I go out and I collect post-it note messages. And each post-it note is an environmental action on something that you're already doing towards a better future. And then I took all of these messages that I've collected for the last eight years, turned them into this digital design, and then wrapped my entire 50-foot boat in thousands and thousands of the community's actions. So now it was less about this solo girl sailing around Antarctica and more about my ability to carry this voice and carry this message across the global media attention. Not only that, though, I wanted to step it up a little bit more. Antarctica is this really remote region, and the Southern Ocean it can be incredibly dangerous. It's the roaring 40s, the furious 50s, the screaming 60s. And so sending a research vessel down into the Southern Ocean is very costly and quite risky for scientists to actually gather data down there. So me being me, I thought, I'm going to the Southern Ocean. I'm a crazy sailor. I put my hand up to the scientific communities worldwide and said, what can I do that's going to add value to your research? So I ended up partnering with a number of different organisations. And I'm really proud to be able to share with you that I was able to deploy eight weather drifter boys on behalf of the Bureau of Meteorology. We turned my boat into a weather station. So it's actually a data set allowing you to get better forecasting and more accurate forecasts. I was able to deploy an Argo research float. Now these floats cost $30,000 each and basically they sink once deployed down to up to two kilometers using a oil bladder sort of self-floating uh, mechanism internally. And as they sink down, they're taking data sets the entire way down and then they'll sit down in two, two kilometer deep water for up to 10 days and then they'll resurface, ping the data back to CSIRO's database and then they'll go back down for another cycle over a three year period. So they're incredibly valuable and incredibly hard to get in such a remote ocean. That wasn't quite enough for me though. So I ended up converting the sail locker into a micro lab on board the boat. And we installed something called a subsea research unit that I rented from the ocean race. Now this unit basically has a flow through water system and it's taking data sets and measurements the entire way around Antarctica 24 seven. And the data sets it was able to take was acidity levels, salinity levels, chlorophyll, PCO2, oxygen. And measurements like PCO2 is the amount of carbon that the ocean's actually absorbing out of our atmosphere. And the Southern Ocean is this incredibly unique biodiversity and it absorbs more carbon out of our atmosphere than any other ocean on the planet. So to give the scientists a better understanding of what is actually happening compared to what the modeling's saying they think is happening, um, I was able to collect this data 24-7 for the entirety of the record. On top of that, I wanted to run a campaign around microplastics. It's this new knowledge and no data exists in the Southern Ocean on microplastics. So I was able to collect over 180 samples that are going to be sent up to the Australian Institute of Marine Science to be processed. And that'll give us an understanding of, again, what the modelling's showing us compared to what's actually happening and give them some baseline data to work with. On top of this, it is the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science. It is an incredible decade for change and for scientific in endeavours in the Southern Ocean and in all our oceans. So I partnered with Oceans Ops in, uh, in Germany, uh, and they run a citizen science branch of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science called the Odyssey Program. 
So through that, I was able to make sure that this data is not only going to be available in Australia, but globally available to scientific groups and organisations around the world. On top of that, I partnered with the Seabed 2030 program and assisted with mapping the seafloor while I'm circumnavigating Antarctica. And just to wrap it up, I also wanted to make sure that I wasn't making an impact. So on board the boat, it was really important to make sure that I was able to sail that boat in a carbon neutral manner. So on board, I had three wind generators, one kilowatt of solar, and then working in partnership with Biodiesel Industries Australia and Refueling Solutions, who are here today, I was able to run biodiesel fuel throughout my engine for the entirety of the record. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions around biodiesel, and many of you here are here to educate people. And so many people all said to me, well, basically everyone said to me, you can't take biodiesel to Antarctica, it's too cold. But where there's a problem, there's always a solution. So we built a heat exchanger system in the boat, so we preheat the fuel before running it through the engine, and it worked like a charm the entire way around Antarctica. So today, I wanted to ask you a question. You're all leaders in the industry. You're leaders in Australian businesses, both here and around the world. And I want you to stand up and become ambassadors for our oceans and our planet. We have this incredible opportunity to create change. And this conference is an opportunity for you to coordinate, to ignite conversation and educate yourselves further around bio industries and what fuels and systems are available. So I'm gonna ask you this question. As a solo sailor, I went to the Southern Ocean into the world's most dangerous ocean. And I did that so that I could create messaging and action around climate change and around the citizen science work I was able to do down there. As business leaders, with the resources and the funds that you have available to you today, what's your climate action? What can you do to help our future? It's a short speech today. You can read more in my book, but thank you so much. And uh, I really, really hope you guys enjoy your conference and really utilise this opportunity to network and coordinate with everyone as we go forward in biofuturing Australia. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Lisa. What an inspiring story um, with so many important messages in there. I, I feel like it's such a um, juxtaposition to talk about the vulnerability of the oceans, in particular in your case, um, whilst hearing stories about it throwing a 10 ton boat around the ocean. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for sharing uh, your story with us and I look forward to reading more in the book. Um, my name is Heidi Half. I am the um, sustainability lead for the Boeing company for the Asia-Pacific region, but I'm here in my capacity as chair for the Sustainable Aviation Fuel Alliance of Australia and New Zealand. And I'm going to moderate a bunch of really great speakers for um, the session ahead. Uh, I wanted to start by also recognising uh, the traditional custodians of the land we are on now, Mianjin. Um, in Brisbane, the Turrbal and Yagara people, and also for all those of you online and the lands that, um, that you're located. I also wanted to say thank you to Bioenergy Australia and Shahana, Lauren and Julia in particular for organising us today, but as a chair of one of the committees for organising us all of the time so well. So thank you so much. So our session is going to focus on, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to focus on um, freight, transport and defence. Um, I think it's a really great way to start these industry discussions for the day, given that arguably these are uh, industries that underpin so many of the others. They certainly underpin Australia's economy, um, the, our way of life, and are essential to how we're going to decarbonise um, Australia. These industries are also some of the most hard to abate. Uh, and uh, we have a, a bunch of innovation going on within some of the companies you're going to hear from today, um, particularly around um, operational efficiencies. Uh, but key to these industries decarbonising are sustainable uh, fuels and biofuel fuel, it plays a very big role in that. Uh, there's been multiple studies to show, and we've heard already this morning, about the potential, um, particularly around our diversity of feedstocks in Australia and opportunities in regional parts of um, our country. Um, but we've also seen in those uh, research um, studies and recommendations the role of government and the important role government plays uh, in helping set uh, the scene for the growth of this industry. 
So we're going to hear, as I said, from some great speakers. I'm going to introduce them all, um, and then you'll hear from them one by one. And, uh, and then we will have some time for some Q&A, which I will moderate, and there'll be some roving mics. So um, as they're going through speaking, please think of your questions and hold on to them, and we'll get them at the end. So firstly, I'd like to uh, introduce Angela Gillam. Um, Angela is the deputy CEO for now, <laughs> soon to be CEO of the Maritime Industry Australia Mail. Uh, she, uh, Angela's been with the association for almost 20 years, uh, having worked on, with members on a wide range of issues um, and policy matters. And she's currently leading the association's advocacy activities on decarbonising the Australian ma maritime industry. Angela will be speaking to us about the male maritime decarbonisation pro uh, program and some of the drivers and key challenges in decarbonising shipping. Angela will be followed by Emma Wilson. Emma is the Director of Policy and Advocacy for Airlines for Australia and New, and New Zealand. A for ANZ is an industry group that represents airlines based in Australia and New Zealand. And Emma works across key public policy issues, including airport regulation, air, aviation security, and sustainability. Emma's going to be briefing us on uh, decarbonising Australia's aviation sector and specifically uh, some early outtakes for some research being done by the group on um, a decarbonisation roadmap. We will then hear from Heather Bone. Heather is the Director of ESG for Toll Global Express. Heather looks after all environment, social and governance matters for Toll Global Express, which is one of uh, Australia's um, largest transports and logistic company, and, and interestingly, one that is truly intermodal, covering operating across rail, road, air, and shipping. We'll then hear from Captain Andrew Stewart. Andrew is um, the, Marit the Marine Management Specialist for Oceana ANL Container Lines. Uh, Captain Andrew, will, he looks after all of the technical elements in shipping operations from funnel to hull and everything in between. And he'll be speaking to us about ANL's vision for decarbonising building Oceana's sustainable shipping network and specifically about their containerised biofuel trial. Second to last, we'll hear from Mike Everton. Mike is the Chief Executive Officer for Oceana Biofuels. Mike will be talking to us about the feedstock opportunities in Australia and telling us a little bit about a recently announced Gladstone-based renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel refinery. And finally, we'll be hearing from Dr. Adriana Downey. Uh, Adriana is a Senior Commercialization Officer at Lysella. Uh, Adriana is a PhD qualified chemical engineer who's been working on the development of bio biotechnologies for 18 years, both in Australia and in Canada. Adriana will run us through uh, the pre-election pre commitment by the Labor government for investing in exploring renewable fuels for defence. Uh, just a reminder that I'll be taking questions at the end, so, so please hold on to them and we'll come back to that. And with that, I'd like to welcome Angela to the stage. Thank you, Heidi, and um, thanks to um, Shahana and her team and everyone at Bioenergy Australia for inviting Mile to come along and speak to you today. Um, I'll kick off by explaining a little bit about Mile, and I only have a very short amount of time that's going to be um, brutally enforced. So I'll, I've only got very few slides, and I really hope that um, what I'm going to say to you inspires some questions. So. Um, yeah, happy to take questions afterwards. So Maritime Industry Australia is Australia's peak body for the Australian shipping and maritime industry. We've got a really diverse membership base. So some of our members operate large um, ocean-going container ships, tankers, bulk carriers, chemical tankers. Um, so that piece in itself, the international shipping piece, is really quite diverse. We also uh, represent operators in the offshore oil and gas industry. So um, uh, vessels supplying and servicing offshore platforms, uh, which is an interesting industry in itself because I sort of see that transitioning in the future to um, some of our offshore renewable resource um, potential growth areas. But we also, we also have a large cohort of members who, who operate within the, what we call the domestic commercial vessel sector. So ferries, work boats, um, towage, dredges, those smaller purely domestic operations um, uh, are also involved in our association. So an incredibly broad membership base and an incredibly um, 
uh, broad range of industries and operations that definitely have an interest in, in bioenergy. So this is focusing on international shipping. Um, we represent about 2.7% of total global emissions, so that's just international shipping. And it's been estimated that the business is, as usual scenario, so projections out to 2050 would see 50 to 250% increase in those emissions. So that is, that's if we, we did, if we did nothing to address um, carbon emissions from the industry. There's variable projections, but, um, but that's probably one of the most extreme um, scenarios. Now, the, the huge variation is because underpinning international shipping activity is global trade. So it is very, very closely tied to um, fluctuations in, in the, the global trade environment, which, which when you think about it is quite obvious. Um, it's also really important to think about the importance of shipping for our way of life. And I think most people forget that shipping really underpins our economy in so many ways, particularly for an island nation like Australia. A couple of characteristics about ships. Um, it's an incredibly capital intensive industry. Ships cost a lot of money. They cost a lot of money to build. They cost a lot of money to run. Uh, fuel and wages, are, fuel in particular, is, is a key cost component um, a, along with the human side. They're, they're, they have a long asset life. So usually you would expect a ship to operate for around 25 to 30 years. That's changing as technology is moving um, along and um, some, some ships are being phased out a lot earlier. But when you build a ship, you would expect to get between 25 to 30 years life out of that, that asset. Uh, freight rates can be quite volatile. We're at a peak in the market at the moment. Some of the freight rates um, that, that are being uh, obtained by particularly the container industry are incredibly high at the moment. But only a few years ago, that was not the case. So it's a volatile market. Um, it's at its peak at the moment. So ship owners are spending money. But, but when, you, when you're in a trough, it's really, really difficult to get ship owners to spend, um, to spend money on their assets. There's an interesting relationship between the ship owner and the charterer. So while a lot of the regulation and a lot of the expectation falls upon the shoulders of the ship owner, uh, with respect to carbon emissions, it's actually the charterer who pays the fuel. And this, this is sort of a difficult relationship when you're trying to incentivise upgrades and, um, and expenditure to increase efficiency from, from the ship owner's perspective. It's because they're less incentivised to do so. Um, it's really the charterer who pays the cost of fuel. So that's, um, I guess it's worth mentioning that because to, to really crack this nut um, in decarbonisation with the maritime industry, it's, it's important to consider all of the uh, stakeholders in, in operating a ship. So it's the, the charterer, the ship owner um, and the whole value chain, the ports. Um, it, it, it's a complex picture, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make. So what are the drivers? The international shipping industry is governed uh, by international conventions that are developed at the International Maritime Organization. So it's a very slow moving feast, but in the world of decarbonisation, things are actually traveling quite quickly at the moment um, compared to other, other issues that I've witnessed uh, moving through the IMO. We've got some new regulation coming in in 2023. These new regulations will uh, look will require to will require international shipping to operate much more efficiently. Um, there's some technical measures, so vessels need to comply with a uh, baseline of efficiency specific to that ship type. And if they don't comply, they need to um, implement some kind of technical fix uh, in order to ensure that they do comply. There's also operational um, carbon intensity um, indicators. So this requires ships to operate in, in a much more efficient way. Um, and this really is a key driver towards bioenergy. Some operators will not be able to comply no matter what they do to their ship, purely because of the types of trades that they're operating within. Um, things around ship design, they're just not going, going to be able to meet um, the, the efficiency requirements that will be um, coming down the line. So these, these trades specifically are really, really keen on, on looking at, at bioenergy and how bioenergy can um, address some of their 
issues. I'm getting, uh, I'm getting a, uh, a warning. Um, the other drivers are the EU ETS. Let's not forget there's emissions trading systems that are occurring around the world, really driving action in this space. But also the market focusing on scope three emissions is a major driver. So we have this uh, IMO regulation that moves very, very slowly. But in many ways, I would suggest that things have overtaken IMO and this focus on scope three emissions um, is, is, critical, is a critical part of the decision making for ship owners to, to increase their efficiency. And of course, shareholder activism. The Australian industry, we're huge, hugely reliant on, on shipping, which makes sense. We're an island nation. We're, we're um, the third, uh, sorry, the fifth largest user of shipping in the world. When you consider our, the size of our economy and, and our uh, population, that, that's a significant statement. Um, also, there's 22,000 domestic commercial vessels operating within Australian waters. Um, so it's a huge potential market for bioenergy. So what's missing? What's, what, what are some of the blockers? Um, the, the, the regulatory and structural elements in Australia um, required for the industry to transition have been absent, and I don't think that's going to be news to anyone in this room. Um, currently, the available drop-in fuels are uneconomical. There's, there's a lot of biofuel trials happening around the coast and around the world, but, but we just can't bridge that gap between um, the cost gap between bioenergy and, and traditional fuels. However, the Australian industry is highly motivated. Um, I have daily conversations with members who are looking to partner with bioenergy providers and, and discuss ways that we can actually move from just adopting trials and pilots to, to taking up the use of bioenergy in, in the real world. So it's an exciting time. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Um, that was awesome. And it seems like there's a lot of parallels between shipping and aviation. So I'm here to talk today about decarbonising Australia's aviation sector which I'm sure you'll agree is one of the most challenging sectors to decarbonise. It's fair to say the aviation industry was left devastated by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Nevertheless, Australia's airlines remain steadfast in achieving net zero emissions by 2050. To progress our commitment to net zero, we're in the process of developing an Australian roadmap for sustainable flying and I'm pleased to be able to share some preliminary modelling with you today. As we progress the development of our roadmap, we've had the benefit of learning from international experience. However, unlike roadmaps from Europe and the UK, which focus strongly on zero emission aircraft and flying less, the Australian roadmap will look quite a bit different given the type of flying that we do here. Aviation has four key levers to reach net zero emissions, improving operations and air traffic management, technology, including zero emission aircraft and fleet renewal, sustainable aviation fuels, or SAF, and the use of high quality offsets. Australian airspace is already extremely efficient compared to the rest of the world, so our gains in this space are expected to be small. The bulk of emission savings in Australia will come from improvements in technology and through the use of SAF. We're a large island nation traversing long distances, even with our domestic flying. So just as flying less and modal substitution isn't a realistic option for Australian travellers, neither are electric or hydrogen powered aircraft for the majority of flying that we do here, at least for the foreseeable future. We estimate that total reductions from zero emission aircraft will be less than 4%, with fleet renewal playing a much larger role at about 27% of total emission savings by 2050. How do we make up the rest? Well, we know SAF is the single most important facilitator of our aviation sector reaching net zero by 2050. So this is some of our preliminary modelling on potential pathways to net zero. As you can see, this pathway uses conservative inputs for SAF, assuming life cycle savings of 80% and 
and a blending rate which caps out at 60%. We know that this is likely to be extremely conservative, given the recent trials with 100% SAF use and the likelihood of achieving up to 100% life cycle savings through new and emerging SAF technology. However, even in this conservative scenario, and you'll see SAF in the red there, you can see that it's a major part of our pathway to net zero. This pathway shows a more ambitious deployment of SAF with higher life cycle savings and higher blending rates. As you can see, this ambitious yet more likely scenario shows that SAF accounts for more than 50% of total emission savings by 2050. I should note that the critical assumption that underpins all modelling on decarbonisation pathways for aviation is that SAF will be supported by government investment and a supportive policy framework. Decarbonising the aviation sector requires a coordinated and nationally consistent set of policy interventions to rapidly strengthen the business case for private investment, stimulate demand, and bridge the price differential between SAF and conventional jet fuel. Failure to achieve this will result in slower emission reductions and slow Australia's progress to net zero by 2050, necessitating a faster and higher cost of transition in the future. So, we've established why SAF is necessary for the aviation sector, but a local SAF industry also has the potential to provide major benefits to the Australian economy and community more broadly. On the back of ARENA's Bioenergy Roadmap and Bioenergy Australia's Bridging the Gap report, we commissioned analysis to understand the potential value of an Australian SAF industry. We found that a standalone domestic industry across the total supply chain could create almost 7,500 jobs by 2030 and more than 15,000 jobs by 2050. We found that a local industry could also contribute almost $3 billion annually in additional GDP by 2030 and more than $7.5 billion annually by 2050. In the current geopolitical climate and with fuel prices through the roof, it'd be remiss of me to not mention the positive impact that a domestic SAF industry could have on Australia's liquid fuel security, removing our reliance on imported liquid aviation fuel. So how do we get there? Well, a few months ago, we saw the exciting announcement of Australia's first renewable diesel and SAF refinery by Oceania Biofuels in Gladstone. It's such a positive first step, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more from Mike this morning. But realising the full potential of an Australian SAF industry requires government and industry working together to, co to develop a coordinated national vision and strategy. The Australian aviation industry is united in our desire to see the federal government convene an Australian Jet Council. The purpose of a Jet Council is to bring together industry and government at both a state and federal level to work to accelerate the commercial production and use of Australian-made SAF. Since 2020, Jet Councils have been established in the UK and Canada and more recently, the New Zealand government has announced their intention to create a public-private partnership to focus on decarbonising their aviation sector. We see the formation of an Australian Jet Council as the critical first step to creating a robust and viable domestic SAF industry, ensuring the necessary decision makers are around the table to consider what policy framework will work best for the Australian environment. We know from international experience, it isn't a one-size-fits-all option, and certainly not only one policy lever that needs to be pulled. It's going to take a suite of supportive policies to ensure adequate feedstock, stimulate demand, support and scale production, and all importantly, bridging that cost differential. Achieving aviation's net zero emissions targets and creating a strong domestic SAF industry isn't going to be easy. It's going to take sustained and cooperative action from everyone across the aviation sector, including airlines, airports, fuel producers, regulators, and government. We're keeping it to a tight seven today, so that's all from me at the moment, but please don't hesitate to come and chat to me later, and I'll try and answer any questions you have during the panel discussion. I'll now hand over to Heather Bone from Toll. Thanks, Heather. Emma. 
Hi everyone, it's so nice to see everyone's faces again after so much time, yay. I don't know about you, but I'm freezing. So if you can hear me shivering, I apologize in advance for that. It's really, really cold up here. And Heidi and I were trying to decide whether to leave our jackets on and stand up or we'll just shiver. Um, so my name's Heather Bone. I know so, so many of you in the room um, and, it, and I'd love to speak after this as well. I'm gonna keep this really short as well. Oh, okay. I'll go backwards. There we go. I'll just talk. Um, we told group um, people in the room probably have heard of previously. Um, the actual toll group was sold to Japan Post in 2015. Last year, as of the 1st of September, the Australian and New Zealand operations for Toll Global Express came back to Australia. So I'm really excited to say everything is coming back to Australia. Um, what that means, though, is, as Heidi, Heidi mentioned, we've, and I've got this great slide that I now can't show you. Which one? I'm, I'm just showing some, poor, oh no, oh, there we go. We are, <laughs> there we go. We are absolutely committed to being an ESG leader in this space. Um, Increasingly, you'll find private equity. We all know that the super funds are looking at ESG commitments, but the biggest thing for us is around our decarbonisation. So, what does that mean? We have 155 facilities. That means I need renewable energy sources for my facilities. That's really challenging to do because we don't necessarily own them. So we have to get the commitments from the landlords to work with us on solar and behind the meter solutions. Excuse me. Um, we have 7,000 trucks. We have that again in subcontractors. And we know that we're going to have to make a really big impact here. There's going to be the need for every solution that the people in this room are going to want to talk about. We are absolutely committed to changing out that smaller part of our fleet, our light and medium rigids, to electric vehicles. There's going to be a role for that, but it's going to be a limited role because it's only going to be about 150, 200, maybe 300 kilometres. So there's a fairly limited role for heavy vehicles in the electric market. And it's just not ready yet. Um, at the very top end of the market, we know we're going to need hydrogen fuel cells, liquid hydrogen, all of those solutions as well. But when you talk to the OEMs, and we tend to be very OEM-centric, um, we aren't even going to be able to get test mules in Australia until the end of this decade. So as much as I love to push hydrogen, it's not going to be the real world for our trucks for a long time to come. We have a critical gap in the middle that needs to be filled by renewable diesel. Please tell me and bring me renewable diesel at an economically sensible price, okay? We have to drive down the industry for this on pricing and close that gap. But please, please bring me renewable diesel. I'm so excited that we're going to have, um, hopefully as of next year, the methodology under the ACUs for renewable diesel, for SAF, for EVs and for hydrogen. I need all of them. So I've got 7,000 trucks. I've got that again of uh, subcontractors. I've got 2,000 forklifts that I need to transition to either hydrogen or to electric forklifts. I've got two ships. Very proud, proud to say that we've got two row row ships, roll on, roll off ships, which I think is sort of ironic to call them row row, but no one else seemed to find that as funny as I do. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, so we own the two ships that go back and forth between the mainland and Tasmania, um, and we have 41 planes. And that's just at last count of all of our assets. I need SAF, I need renewable diesel, I need hydrogen, I need biodiesel, I need all of these solutions, and there's not going to be one magic silver bullet. I can say that if all of those things fall into line, though, there is really no reason why we can't meet that goal that I showed up before, which is a 50% emission reduction by 2030. That's my commitment to my board. And we believe that by 2035, again, if all of these things fall into line, we believe by 2035 we can be net zero. Now, I don't want to be offsetting. I want real emission reductions. I don't want to get into this loop of offsetting. I think that's the, the end goal when you can't do anything else, let's do offsetting. But honestly, come and talk to me, contact me. I want to hear about your projects. I want to take your products. Um, I will be the one to finish early because I'm shivering. 
<laughs> I would not go to Antarctica. I can't imagine anything worse than that. Good morning, everybody. I am not cold. I think it's warm up here. I'm from Melbourne. Um, CMA is our parent group. ANL looks after the Oceania side of the business. We're an important part for CMA. As you can see, the uh, figures, revenue figures are quite huge in US dollars. And there's 150,000 people employed by the group, of which 320 plus are down here in Australia and New Zealand and the islands. Um, we've, our company is owned by a family. There's no shareholders, just a family. And it's easy to get them to give commitments to a zero carbon emission policy downstream. The three pillars that we're based on is act, acting for people, acting for the planet, and acting for fair trade. We are looking at biofuel. We're waiting for the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, hopefully in December at the next Maritime in, uh, Marine Environment Panel Committee, they will recognize biofuel as a sustainable fuel. If they do that, our company, which operates nearly 600 ships now, require, if you take the LNG burners out of the equation, require we use 8.9 million tonnes of fuel a year, heavy fuel. We need 10% of that to be biofuel. So we are like told. We, we need people to start producing this at a reasonable price so that we can have something in the interim to take us towards decarbonisation downstream. So biofuel to us is an important part, as well as LNG is an important part of this transition we're going through. As mentioned previously, with the sponsorship of Queensland Government and Woolworths, and with the backing of the Port of Brisbane and BP Marine, we did the first containerised biofuel trial in Oceania on the Australian coast with the APL Houston, which is a 5,700 TU vessel. The cargo, the biofuel, a B20 blend, was mixed on board the bunker barge here in Brisbane and delivered to the ship, and then we consumed it on the Australian coast. This ship is in a regular trade, six-week trade, around this region. What we're looking at in the future, although the IMO want to get to 70% carbon reduction by 2050, our group and our chairman is committed to zero carbonisation by 2050. So in order to get there, as Angela mentioned, with charter ships, they reluctant, the owners are reluctant to spend money on them. So we've been on a spending spree over the last 14 months and we have purchased 75 second-hand ships to join our fleet, where we will spend money on them to bring them up to the standard required for January 2023. We've... Oh, gone back. That's all right. So to finish off... What we've got at the moment, we've got a building program from now until 2025 for 69 new ships. Six of those new ships are going to be 15,000 TU dual-fueled methanol-powered vessels. And um, the first order for methanol, this is the first order for methanol-powered vessels and is in line with CMA CGM strategy to expand its energy mix with the goal of achieving net zero carbon by 2050. CMA CGM is thus accelerating its decarbonisation trajectory by investing massively in gas and methanol vessels. We'll have about 49 
gas vessels by 2025 in the fleet. The two sectors will be complementary for decarbonising the shipping industry in years to come. With that, I'll say thank you. Look forward to your questions, and I present Mike Everton. Thank you, Andrew. Well, I feel a bit of pressure from my colleagues in the front there. Uh, I'd like to thank Shahana and her team for putting on the conference. I think it's uh, a great turnout, and uh, hopefully we can all come together in the near future. I'm Mike Everton. I'm the CEO of Oceana Biofuels. We're develop, uh, developing a plant in Gladstone. This plant will be the first renewable diesel and SAF facility. It's a major mile step for Australia, for Gladstone, and we see this as an integral part of our companies coming together, the, the country uniting and now building a focus going forward. So, why, why now? We, we believe it is the right time. Australia needed to embrace this, and I think the moving forward on this will help create industry drive, government drive, that is critical for us to, to have a sustainable fuel. And as my colleague said down the front, sustainable. If it's not sustainable and if it's not at the right price, it's not achievable, and we get that. We need to work with farmers, we need to work with industry leaders and to push this forward as fast as we can. Australia has an abundant of feedstock, abundant of energy requirement, and we can be the leaders in this technology for this region. So, oh, here we go. Thanks. These are some of the main points that I need to cover today, but of course, very tight time frame. The plant will be the first in Australia. It will be SAF, and we can produce SAF from multi-feedstock. But again, the challenge is the feedstock. The first 3.6 3, 3 or 3, 360 million litres of fuel, we already have agreements in place for feedstock. Stage two is the critical marker, and that we have to work with the farmers, the growers, industry, to develop this feedstock that doesn't impact on food. We have to work with farmers to grow and rotational crops grow food and grow fuel. It has to be accepted and embraced. You have to do that. Gone are the days where you think all of this is going to come from waste. It will not in our industry. We see ourselves as a bridge. We know the next 30 years needs to develop new technologies, but we see this bridge where we can provide fuel for the existing infrastructure, and that is critical. And we have to provide it at a price that makes it economically benefit for Heather to push her trucks Andrew to push round his ships and service the industry properly. There's been too much gouging and there's been too much uh, unknown as to where we develop the next program. Farming is the key to this. But farming in a sustainable way that allows food and fuel to work together. You can't have food without fuel. It's very important. As, as Heather pointed out, we need to move feed. We need to move food. This has become now a critical point in the industry. Um, we, we're, we're proud to announce now that we have the first tranche of our feedstock for 360 million, all in place right now. We have offtakes, we're negotiating heavily now and can confirm that we're working with Qantas on both offtake and investment. We're working with Virgin, we're working with industry uh, partners in the construction, in, uh, uh, in moving, if you like, this next quantum leap. Uh, I think that the most important thing that we need to stress, though, is working together and understanding each company's requirements and needs. Why Gladstone? Well, we, we travelled up the East Coast. I left Melbourne. It was summer two years ago. Came to New South Wales, came to Queensland, ended up in Gladstone and stopped. Queensland is the most progressive state in the country for developing renewable fuels. The support that we've got from the, the government, the councils, the port authorities and the general populace in Gladstone is second to none. And I think for companies that are looking to invest, Queensland is the, the state of opportunity. 
sorry, I'll, I'll just go back. If you look at our facility, it's, it's got multiple use. We can have a, a, a large port facility there, pipeline. Uh, the land there is already permitting. The permitting process to work with, with the councils and the government has been exceptional. A 12-month program that in any other state would take two years. If you look at our little process, I, I, I have to keep this brief, we're basically looking for uh, management of feedstock to fuel and they, these are the industries. We understand this, the bridge for SAF. We understand the road transportation. The next part of this, as I said, is the full alimentation. We see the growth in this industry now as the dot-com of, of the 2020s. This is, this is the industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, but has to be managed and regulated and not a free fall. We're dealing with some major partners, as you can see. Wood, our EPC contractors, KPMG have worked through the modelling to give us the best uh, production facility at the best price, bringing the proper economics to it. This is not a dream anymore, this is a reality. We've all seen, you know, uh, uh, industries come and go. We've seen people trying to put programs together. This is reality. Um, we see the future. We see a very driven plan and we see working cooperation between all of the partners. Thank you very much. nervous as to whether my slides will pop here. <laughs> oh, but they do. Hello everybody, good morning. I'm Adriana Downey from Lysella. Thanks for, to Shahana uh, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, they did on the, on the back of a pre-election announcement by the Labor Party that they were going to make a $5 million commitment uh, to Lysella for advancing their works on getting certification for biofuels to go into the defence industry. And uh, Mike provides an excellent um, segue into this because we, uh, Lysella is very aware that HEPA and, and the oils and fats are going to provide a nice gateway bridge. Uh, Lysella's focus is looking at lignocellulosic feedstocks to go into, into biofuels. And so the Labor government made this announcement uh, on the back of a project that Lysella is working um, with the Burdekin Renewable Fuels Group, who are being presenting later today, to look at the feasibility of developing a, uh, a hydrothermal liquefaction plant using Lysella's technology in the Burdekin region on tops and trash um, from the sugarcane industry uh, into, into biofuels. And the region up there has got a, a huge biomass resource uh, which is available and, and can be economically brought in, uh, aggregated to um, a production facility. And Lysella has been working in the region to demonstrate the proof of concept. So we've been able to take some of the chops and trash material, process it through our uh, demonstration facilities which we have on the central coast of New South Wales, uh, to convert that material to a bio-crude oil, which is uh, a renewable analogous to, to crude oil in the fact that it can actually be upgraded and hydro-treated um, through a number of um, ways, either through co-processing in existing refineries or through standalone upgraders, uh, into the range of fuels that are typical of, of uh, oil refineries. So we've actually demonstrated um, with partners at the University of Newcastle that we've been We've taken the sugarcane trash from the Burdekin, we've, we've converted it into a biocrude in Lysella's process, and we've then hydro-treated it to make a biokerosene uh, in the fuel ranges. So we've demonstrated the whole pathway and, and done it here in Australia. The Labor government, this tweaks their, their, their interest. Um, it came from Brendan O'Connor from the, as when he was the shadow minister from defense. And uh, the announcement came prior to the election and as we're, the government is now finding their feet, we believe that the commitment is now in, in Pat Conroy's office. Uh, he has the brief for it 
And although we don't know any more than what the initial announcement was, they assure me that they are, you know, the, the general vibe of the, the, the announcement is, is definitely their policy driver, which was basically around fuel security, being able to um, be able to have a supply of fuel that is locally produced that we can provide to the Defence Forces who are highly sensitive to um, the import of, of fuels for their system. We have a very short uh, um, reserve of fuels for defence and, and for all of us to drive around. And really, it's a vulnerability of, of our defence system. So the number one policy driver was that. But then following um, in their announcement, they also paid lip service to policy, like two, three, four, five, of all of the benefits that we know working in the industry um, that the bioenergy industry can deliver to, to our economy and to our societies. And so Lysella very much um, wants to make a business case out of making biofuels, but as from a government perspective, we actually believe that we can deliver on, on um, multiple of the sustainable, sustainable development goals um, that our economies are trying to achieve. And we have a situation um, which we're all aware of. We're trying to move towards a circular economy because we have the, you know, we're digging up fossil fuels out of the ground. They're moving through our economy. We're harvesting primary resources. We're digging up resources from the ground, which takes fuel and energy to do that. Uh, but there is a disconnect with the residues from a lot of our industries. And there's a lot of opportunity in Australia to utilise those residues uh, more productively. We also have a disconnect, especially in Australia, due to we are an island nation, we're heavily dependent on importing, and we're also, um, our refinery capability has decreased, and uh, we now have a significant um, lack of refining infrastructure in, in Australia to, to allow us to be self-sustainable in fuels. So we're relying heavily on imports, and especially defence is relying hev heavily on imports of fuels that can make, meet their military specifications. And we've seen the story of Lysella is, is, a, is a common one for startup companies and, and innovation companies in this country, that we develop the, our technology here in Australia, but we're seeing commercialisation success overseas. Uh, we've got four fully funded uh, projects now overseas because we're driven to markets that are incentivised and have policy settings and government settings, such as in British Columbia, where they have... Um, drivers for renewable fuels that we don't have here. And so as a national fuel security play, we need to start fostering more industry and here. And uh, Lysella would dearly love to, to be um, delivering bioenergy projects here in Australia. And we believe that Lysella's technology does provide that bridge to achieving a circular economy and being able to take the residues, of which there are plentiful, um, especially in the lignocellulosic space in Australia, to be able to convert those to a biocrude that we can, as, a, as an interim, upgrade in, by co-processing. But also we have the opportunities to, to bolster the ability to upgrade and to finish fuels here in Australia. Uh, Lysella has, through their joint venture with Canfor um, under Arbios, we have an alliance with Shell. We're working with Shell um, to develop a dedicated upgrader technology to couple with our technology so that we can actually have a upgrader that is scaled to the size of our CAT HTI facilities, um, either through a large facility. In the Burdekin region, there's enough aggregation of biomass, but in other areas, we could hub and spoke to get enough um, enough biocrew to justify a standalone upgrader. But our goal is to be able to couple together um, the full supply chain to a finished fuel, and we could do that here in Australia. Uh, and via our alliance with Shell, which is non-exclusive, but we're looking to work with Shell to deliver a complementary technology for upgrading. And what was exciting to us, I guess, um, to bring it back to the announcement, is that this is a new approach for defence. In the announcement, Labor uh, indicated they will task defence um, to work with biofuel manufacturers um, and through their defence fuel transformation program, which is a new approach because we have seen that defence has typically been trying to more and more contract out and have third parties managing their fuel supplies. Uh, so we're hoping that moving forward with the new government that there will be a shift to the defence being able to more, work more closely um, 
With us, Lysella looks forward to working closely with defence and governments. We all know we have to work together. Like Mike says, it's a team effort. We have to have a coalition of the willing to actually get us to a bioenergy um, industry here in Australia. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you to all of the speakers, um, especially for adhering to our very strict time policy and my annoying standing to the side. As everyone comes up on stage um, to get ready to answer your questions and have a bit of a chat, I'm going to kick off with questions, but I just wanted to remind you there'll be um, roving mics around the room, so um, pop up your hand and I'll see if I can see you and, and we'll get a mic to you. Also, we're going to try and capture some questions from online. So um, if you're online, put the questions in the chat box and we'll see if we can get someone to read them out for you as well. Um, so thank you all for um, such interesting uh, presentations, just a snippet of what's going on in each of your organisations. I wanted to kick us off with perhaps each of you giving me a brief, um, giving us all a brief um, insight into what you think are the barriers for your particular uh, industry and how you think your industry can tackle them. Uh, is this on? Yep. Um, I think I touched on it in my last slide in our presentation. The, the barriers um, for our industry is cost. It, uh, it's very price sensitive. Fuel is a huge um, cost of running a ship. I think it's about 30% or, or maybe more, depending on the fuel cost at the time. Um, so, yeah, cost. And another sort of flow on question, sorry, issue from that is are consumers willing to pay? And I think uh, we've asked that question um, during our own uh, conferences and, and summits, and, and the clear answer is no, n not, not at the moment. So cost is a major one. At the risk of being very repetitive, cost is also a major issue for the aviation sector when it comes to sustainable fuels. As I mentioned in my presentation, we've been one of the industries hardest hit by COVID. So we're in recovery at the moment and don't have that ability to pay more for fuel, um, you know, up to six times the price as the current cost of SAF versus traditional fuel. So we see that bridging that cost gap is the most important and there's some great policies that have been explored by Bio Bioenergy Australia into the Bridging the Gap report. I'm not sure. Oh, it is on. Excellent. Well done. Um, you know what? I, I look around the room and I think for those of us who've been in the industry for 20 years, it sort of felt like Groundhog Day for, for a long, long time. But I think there's a genuine change in the air now. I really do think that there is a, a, a driver behind it. And I, I would say that um, aside from cost, I actually think it's courage. I think that businesses need to have the courage of their convictions to actually go and do this. And I'm very lucky. I've got a, I've got a CEO in, uh, you might have heard of her, her name's Christine Holgate. Uh, she is extremely passionate about decarbonisation. And I think without the courage to back that and make those decisions and say, okay, we, we are going to drive up the cost of some of these things and the flow on is going to be the consumer. But if we don't do that, we're not going to get there at all. So I think it's courage. I think in our industry, what you're looking at... Yeah, it's on. What you're looking at is with the older ships, we've done literally everything we can do electronic-wise to fine-tune the main engines and the generators on board a ship. So the only option we have left now is to diversify into other fuels, alternate fuels, biofuels and whatever, to get us through this transition period to zero emission fuels. And it's a stumbling block that will take time to fix. But as I say, we do need to get constant, stable supplies of reasonably priced biofuel. I feel the weight on my shoulders. It's, it's, a, real, it's a real interesting conundrum. We have food and we have fuel. Um, for us, it's balancing and managing now feedstock. In the old days in retail, it, it was a cliche. The three, three main factors were location, location, location. With the renewable industry now, it's feedstock, feedstock, feedstock. And it's got to be worked and, and maintained to give everybody an even break from the farmer to the producer 
to the user. And as I said, partnering up will work. Driving one's own agenda never works. And I think if we can come together with government support and industry support, which we haven't had in this country, full stop. Now, we make the changes, we all benefit. So that's the driving force. Thank you. So from Lysella's perspective, it has been, we've been in this industry for a long time and one of the barriers for us was getting through that technology development valley of death from your demonstration facility, R&D, getting to those first commercial scale plants. And I'm happy to say that the tides are turning. We are starting to get some traction. We're currently trying to raise funds for our project in Victoria, but we've now got four fully funded projects overseas that we're actually starting to develop. And that should overcome a lot of the barriers for us, some of them technical, like being able to have enough volume of bio crude to be able to go through the ASTM standards for, for SAP. It's a costly process, but you need volumes that are costly to produce in such small um, size demonstration facilities. So hopefully as the industry, as we start seeing more um, facilities built and more investment actually in infrastructure on the ground, we'll start getting the volumes of, of um, biofuels that allow us to pass through ASTM standards and others so that some of these barriers that have been long standing will start to be able to get through those. That's a great. I think um, reinforcing through all of the answers has been this this theme or, or of the role of government in particular. You know, whether it be cost, courage, um, or, or incentivizing demand. Um, you know, supporting uh, this in industry that is not not new, <laughs> but needs to accelerate and grow. Um, and, and we're seeing such great support from the Queensland government and hopefully from the federal government now going forward. So it's exciting. All right, um, enough talking from me. I want to hand over to you all and sorry for, for squinting at you, but um, questions from, from the audience. Is there anyone want to chuck their hand up with a question and kick us off? Just down the front here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, at Michael Van Baal from uh, Able Energy, we're doing a green hydrogen to methanol project in uh, Tasmania, Bell Bay. And um, I'm glad you mentioned costs because, you know, we're getting to the point where we're moving into feed uh, design. And I think it's going to be very difficult for us to really get our methanol, uh, be able to sell our methanol for much less than $40 US per gigajoule. And I'm just wondering what the panel thinks about how we're going to bridge that gap for first projects. Is, is, it, is it going to require governments to step in? Um, is it going to require uh, consumers, which is really, I think, what probably what Andy would say, it's, it's it often it's, it's now being customer driven in the shipping industry where they're saying decarbonise that shipping leg and we'll pay some extra. But uh, I, th I think particularly for the aviation industry, it must be very difficult to contemplate that, uh, that sort of price pricing, but I don't see too many, I could be wrong, but I don't see too many industries at the moment that can probably supply green fuels for much less than 40 US dollars a gigajoule. Any comments about that? Maybe um, Mike and Adriana, given that you're, uh, you've taken that step into commercialising, mm -hmm. a good place to start. Yeah, and so, the, the, the gap in, in pricing is real and it's very difficult for, especially if you're looking for long-term offtake agreements, also that offtakers are not looking to commit to a multiple, to a high a paying a premium uh, when they are hoping that the industry will mature and that price gap will, will come down. So there's this play off and so, there are mechanisms in contracting of being able to work more collaboratively collaboratively with off-takers to have sliding scales on pricing so that there's a bit of a share of, of the pain. But we also have, have the experience of when oil prices were low, talking to industries of there's no way our industry can survive if, you know, if fuel prices were this, but we're in today that it's, you know, $2.20 to put diesel in your car. We are now at those prices that they said that their industries couldn't survive before and we're still driving around. So there, there is going to have to be some adjustment in the market and some acceptance that, you know, prices are not going to stay the same. But I, I encourage collaborative working through contracting so that you can get the offtake agreement but also share some of the, the, the benefits. Uh, 
Thank you. I'd like to add to that as well. And I think there's two areas we have to look at. One is we're in unstable market at the moment. I've never seen feedstock prices this high, ever. I've been in this industry 25 years. I've got grey hair from it. So, but this is the worst I've seen. it. I think we have to be realistic now. We have a war going on. We had a pandemic. Things will stabilise. Now, are we going to see $2,000 feedstock? Who knows? Um, are we ever going to see, you know, $50, $30 oil? I doubt it. So the next quantum step is to understand what is the real market price. And I don't think today is the day to have that discussion. So, you know, let's let the world settle down again. Let's implement, let's build towards it. But I think we have to be cognizant that, that the future will get brighter. And I think that's what we're going to look forward to. Sure thing. Yeah, grab the mic. Um, I just, I just want to follow on um, on this cost piece because you know, cost is one thing and it's different if it's applied across the board. So if we have a level playing field whereby everybody is required to pay the extra cost and it's not such a big deal. And when I talk about whether the consumer is happy, by consumer I mean you know, charterer, user of ships, if the consumer is 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 not happy to pay a premium it's because they can get a cheaper service elsewhere but if they if they have to pay the premium premium across the board that's the way the market should work and the cost should be passed down to the consumer uh, but it's across the board so so if everyone is paying the higher price it's not in my view it's not such a big deal but but currently we don't have that situation in Australia so you know it's about it's about cushioning the blow for the first movers. So you will have the brave, um, the brave first movers who are willing to take that step and are willing to absorb maybe some of that cost. But how do we share or how do we soften the blow, I think, is, is probably the, the question. Yeah, sure. And, and sort of sideways of the cost um, differential, um, I think there's a real role for government to play in the total cost of ownership and, and trying to bring that gap down. So, you know, there's the Future Fuels program at the moment with ARENA, I'm sure a lot of people here are aware of it. Um, but I think there's a complete lack of education or a complete lack of understanding that one truck can't be compared to another truck. One ship can't be compared to another ship. That'd be like Lisa doing a lap of Hamilton Island versus a lap of Antarctica. And I think there's a real role for education that we need to play as an industry to help government understand the actual costs and why they are so high. Because I, I was at a lunch last week with one of the federal ministers and it, it, was about, um, it was about hydrogen and electric vehicles. And he said, well, if you, can, if you can have an electric bus, you can have an electric truck, right? <laughs> No, <laughs> no, you can't. And, and it was an industry forum and everyone looked at him like he was a raving idiot because, no, you can't. A bus goes from here to here to here to here and here and then it goes back to the depot. A truck goes from here to Townsville to Perth to... You can't compare apples with apples. And I think we have to educate around the impact of those costs in order to get to that level playing field. Yeah, um, Heather, I couldn't agree more... Coming from the aviation sector, there's so much excitement about electric and hydrogen powered aircraft. And I get it, they're super sexy, it's Jetsons now, but it's just not sustainable or viable for the Australian industry. SAF is our only way forward for the majority of flying we do. And it is about education, educating the government at both a state and federal level about actions that they can take that have both a cost and a just a supportive policy to enable us to really um, accelerate SAF production and uptake in Australia. Here, here, from Boeing. Um, um, <laughs> can I just uh, add what you're talking about? We work on the principle that you need about an extra $300 levy on fossil fuel that we use in ships at the moment to compete with the new fuels. The European Union are looking at this of introducing the carbon tax. What they're talking about is any ships that go past the Indian Ocean to Europe, to one of their ports, drop cargo off, pick up cargo for export from there and bring it back towards Asia to that cut-off point in the Indian Ocean, they're looking at charging a carbon tax. 
this will assist in what you're talking about, this price comparison. The other thing is a lot of our major clients are starting to insist on the ships being part of the green highway for their cargo. So if they are willing to pay the price, and remember, for every tonne of heavy fuel we burn on a ship, we're emitting 3.15 tonnes of carbon into the atmosphere. So a carbon tax is probably the way to level out that playing field. Okay, thank you all for that. Is there another question that I can take from the audience? Hi, yeah. Kristen from a and and Captain Andy. You kind of stole my thunder there, but that's okay. We're on the same team. Um, my question to the panel is, um, do, do you find within your organisations, within your networks, that it's more of a risk mitigation um, discussion in that the Corbin, uh, Corbin, carbon adjustment uh, mechanism that... Um, carbon border adjustment mechanism that Captain Andy just mentioned and, of course, carbon zero, 2050, the goals we all have there. Do you find that the conversations are taking more of that turn now or is it still a matter of we need to be brave, we may need to make these moves now, otherwise we just won't get there? I'm going to say something really, really straightforward. In investor relations, in superannuation funds, and a lot of the carbon conversations I'm having, people don't even know what scope one, two and three means. It, it's as simple as that. So I think we, we all know that, right? It's, it's what we live and breathe. But I think there's, um, there's a fundamental driver from the financial markets now to make that change, but they don't necessarily know what that change means. And they certainly don't understand what does scope three mean? You know, when they look at you like, well, I, I've got nothing. Um, so again, I think there's a long way to go in that conversation. But I think if we can challenge the conversation to be about risk and opportunity and uh, how we can overcome some of those climate related risks um, and prepare for them now, then I think that that will certainly help. Uh, yeah, if I can just add to that. So for us in the aviation sector, it's about investor expectations, international obligations, and customer expectations. Customers want to see their airlines taking action on climate, and so we're very motivated to see that through. Yeah, sure. And we can see 2050 is going to come around very quickly, and these are large infrastructure projects that take time to deliver and we can see now with the energy crisis we're having with electricity that we needed to be making the investment in that electricity and infrastructure 10 years ago and now we're suffering that we didn't. We're going to need to be making these investments now and starting to deliver the projects now if we've got any chance of making these 2050 net zero targets. Um, and, and just wanted to add that um, I thought it was interesting, um, the investors that you're talking to in Australia, I, I certainly have experienced a, a something a little different internationally, um, and I think the Boeing company um, is seeing that as an American company and some of the corporate non-financial disclosures that the SEC is about um, talking about bringing in, um, getting some very informed questions from um, investors our industry is. Um, so, um, so I think it's, it's changing globally and, and maybe we're kind of catching up on that front, some of our investors. I think I'd just like to add to that as well. When the biodiesel industry first kicked off, you got no form of investment from the big super funds. Uh, now the tide has changed. Uh, when, since we've announced we've had investor funds from uh, two infrastructure companies and two uh, superannuation funds, uh, wanting to be part of this now. They see it as their ESG moving forward. It's great to hear. Okay, I think we've got time for another question. Is there anyone um, want to pop their hand up? Yeah, who can get we? Excellent. Yeah, you go ahead. Uh, g'day. Um, uh, James Williamson here um, uh, from Neste. Um, thank you to all the speakers. Really informative today. Um, just a quick question for Mike. Um, you touched on some <laughs> support and investment. Um, is your project now fully funded? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Excellent. <laughs> nice. Nice and quick. Another one down. The, yeah, great. Yeah, sorry. Steve Button from Optimal Group. The, a lot of talk about making biodiesel, uh, and, and 
uh, Adrian, I have to excuse myself that I didn't know about what Lysola was doing, but a lot of people are ignoring that all of the equipment we're talking about here still needs lubricants and um, greases to operate. And I'm not seeing too many people about making bio uh, lubricants. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Yeah, so I guess um, there is a whole um, carbon economy and a whole suite of products. And so from Lysella's point of view, we have got programs, we've got R&D, and they go from very fundamental R&D programs with universities to demonstrations and trials. But because our biocrude is going into a standard type refinery setup, we make the whole suite of, of projects from the, the heavy ends uh, to the SAF. So we are going to have a, have a portion of, of SAF diesel th throughout that blend. And then also, um, you know, looking at things like um, biochemicals, lubricants, waxes. Um, there's, there's a whole range of, once you've de depolymerized those organic molecules, you absolutely can, can make other chemicals with them. And, and, and it is there. There's a lot of work going on with universities of, about um, biolubricants and those kinds of things. And, and from a demand side, I found quite interesting, um, and some of you are probably aware that Defence is currently um, developing a uh, future energy strategy, which includes fuels and energy, looking across the entire state, and, and really includes that entire spectrum from fuels, energy that, that required for the estate, as well as all of the lubricants that you can imagine uh, are needed um, in Defence. So from a demand perspective, it's really good to see that, that holistic approach, um, and then hopefully we'll see it transform into demand um, from Defence. And it's also, those co-products actually have the ability to be a big piece in the value chain. So if you can have, you know, even if it's just one or two percent of a specialty chemical out of your, that can, the values of those specialty chemicals can actually drive and help subsidise in a way the, the other portion. So it's definitely an area of interest. And we've seen in the past, um, for example, like with the Ensign plant, making fuel oils, working with Red Arrow, making smoke chemicals as a food additive. The smoke chemical business actually, even though they were a biofuels company, that fuel, food additive actually helped the, the economics of their process incredibly. So we're always looking for opportunities to have value added, higher value um, chemical or other products that complement the, just the fuels um, output from our process. Fantastic, great question. Is there anybody else with a question from the audience? Yes. G'day, it's uh, John Burnett from EDL. Thanks, everybody. This is one for Heather. In the US, we produce biomethane, and that goes into the pipeline, and it's used by a lot, lot of um, midstream-sized trucks for transport, in the type of thing you do. Um, you didn't really mention CNG. Is it something that Toll's looking at, or you're really more focused on batteries and hydrogen? Um. If you and I had had this conversation six months ago, it would be a very different conversation because I was screaming out for biomethane to replace CNG. So Toll in about 2010 invested in 100 CNG vehicles, one of uh, the only companies in the world to do it. From about 2012, they were parked up at our Melbourne airport facility and have done nothing since then because they couldn't get the CNG. Um, you know, I, I even reached out to your CEO to see if we could get CNG. There, we could not do anything to get CNG, let alone buy a CNG. Um, eventually, they were auctioned about a month ago. They were, they were auctioned for, you know, virtually nothing. So, uh, you know, it, 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 CNG actually is a good example of um, when you take that first step in doing something a bit different, and it, and it was, a, you know, a big decision for the for the industry to do that, and it monumentally flopped. And the fear, I think, for the industry and and for the OEMs is that the same thing will happen to EVs that happen to CNG, or the same things will happen to hydrogen that happen to CNG. So, um, like I said, I wish we'd had that. Con you know, I wish you'd. Had reached out six months ago because, you know, I, I couldn't even get the product from Brisbane City Council, any of the councils that still use gas, um, but I couldn't buy it for love or money. Timing is everything. One more question. Do we want to um, see if there are any on from online? Um, oh, I think someone just... Did someone shoot their hand up? 
Okay, someone with their hand up. Okay, that might be better. Um, uh, Lee Williams here from USQ. Um, I've got a question for, um, for Mike um, about one of his comments he had before about um, the agriculture industry. And it was a question of food versus fuel or food working together with fuel. Um, maybe the question is, um, what do you think of the drivers that will kind of force that change in agriculture to change their, their markets from uh, purely a, fu a food market to the, um, the combination of food and the fuel market? Look, it's education. I think that's the first thing. Secondly, we have to lead. So we, we're looking at doing investment into that as well. So you can't just say build a refinery and they will come. It doesn't happen. I mean, the new oil well, rig, whatever you want to call it, is now a 1,000 acres of land, if that's what we're looking at. So we can offer farmers then, one, a competitive price, but we can also offer them a feedstock rotation. And I think that's the key to this. And the, and the further we go down the path with the farmers and, and offer them food to fuel a feedstock rotation, that's what will bring the farmers to it because we can give them a longer term offtake. And let's face it, we have to incentivise farmers. Um, farmers have done it hard for too long. The five, six percent doesn't cut it. Our interest rates are now going up. We have to give back and reward the farmers and by doing that, from the fuel right back to the farm, they, they need part of the action and I think that's what's going to drive the market. Okay, I think that's all we have time for, um, for questions. So I wanted to thank you all for the great questions and engagement. Um, and I specifically wanted to thank our, our speakers, um, Adriana, Mike, Andrew, Emma, Angela, and Heather for their um, expertise. They're gonna be hanging around, so please come and talk to them after um, in one of the breaks. Um, and I think we're now going to have some morning tea. So um, I'll invite you all to jump up and grab a cuppa. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>